guys. For this lesson, we're going to learn Jimmy Herring's first solo from Mississippi Half Step Uptown Toodaloo off of the amazing jazz dead record, Laughing Water. Make sure you visit amarguitar.com so you can check out the tabs and chord diagrams for this lesson. There's a link in the description below. In this lesson, you're going to learn how to play this solo, which I've broken down into four licks. We'll talk about how to play these licks and why they sound so good. The theme of this lesson is how to incorporate arpeggios into your playing, just like Jimmy expertly does here. We're specifically going to go over the seven different arpeggio shapes that he uses and how you can use them in your own playing. We'll also discuss two major takeaways. The first one details a different and easier way to look at every dominant seventh chord you'll ever see in your entire life. And the second involves advice to solve the biggest mistake that I often see students make when they try to incorporate arpeggios into their own improvisation. So grab your guitar and let's dive in. Lick number one. Let's try that slowly. So for this lick, Jimmy starts by outlining the chord tones of A minor, but by approaching them from a half step below. So all of these notes... Those first few notes, again, are all just chord tones of A minor, but just approached from a half step below. So let's take a look at the chord tones of A minor in the shape that we're in, which is the E shape. So we've got root, third, fifth, root, third, fifth, root, third. So what's cool is that that approach that, again, you can use in your playing where you just take some chord tones and then you approach from a half step below gives a really cool kind of an exotic sound. So all of those notes again. Sounds like some cool scale, but it's just chord tones of A minor approached from a half step below. And he kind of uses the half step theme throughout this, this entire solo, which we'll talk about as we go through more licks. So he also, after that he lands on the ninth. He lands on the ninth of A minor seven, which wants to be resolved. And he goes, so he plays some more, he plays down from the ninth root and lands on the seventh of A minor seven, which is the G note. So let's take a look at, at the chord tones of A minor seven in our shape, which is the E shape. So we've got root, third, fifth, seventh, root, third, fifth, seventh, root, third. So after he plays the uh, seventh of A minor seven, he goes, and what he does is he connects the seventh of A minor seven to the third of the next chord, which is D seven, but he approaches by a half step below. So that note right there is the third of our next chord, which is D7. And he's got that half step slide, which sounds really cool. So let's take a, a look at the notes of D7 in the shape that we're in, which is the A shape. So 
we've got fifth, seventh, root, third, fifth, seventh, root, third, fifth, seventh. So all those notes right out of that that A shape of, of D7. And then after that, he goes. Now, what's interesting is all of those notes that we just heard. Those are, that's just the, the A minor 7 shape. But he plays the A minor 7 shape over the D7. And this is a very common approach. And that brings us to our first takeaway. This is an idea called minor conversion. And what that means in this case is that when you see a dominant chord, in, case a, in this case a D7 chord, you can treat it like the minor 7th chord that is a 5th above it. So in our example that we just heard and played, Jimmy sees a D7 chord and he treats it like an A minor 7. So again, he's got... Plays that A minor 7 arpeggio right down the, right down the shape. But he plays that A minor 7 arpeggio over the D7. And this is something that you can use in your playing. So if you ever see um, a dominant chord, a 7, a 13, uh, a 9, uh, G9, C9, for example, uh, what you can do is you can treat that chord like the minor chord that is a fifth above it. So in our case, we've got our D7 chord. And Jimmy treats it like a... A minor 7 chord, which is the chord that is a fifth above it. So in this case, if, if you're unfamiliar with fifths, you can basically go down a string and two frets over, and you've got your the fifth. So D, go down a string, two frets over, A minor. So if you ever see a D7 chord, you can treat it like an A minor 7 chord, which again is what he does right here, and that's why I think this lick sounds so cool. So after he goes, sorry, what he does is he lands on the root of the next chord, which is F7, excuse me, which is F. Right there is our root. So let's play lick number one slowly one more time. Lick number two. Let's try that slowly. So for the beginning of this lick, Jimmy plays right up the C shape of the F major arpeggio. So let's take a look at the F major arpeggio in the shape that we're in, which is the C shape. So we've got fifth, root, third, fifth, root, third, fifth. So again, all these notes right up the arpeggio, except for that note right there, sixth fret of our D string. What he does is he approaches the third of F by a, you guessed it, by a half step. And then after that, he goes, and what that is, is he's playing right down the arpeggio of the next chord, which is D minor. So let's take a look at the D minor in the shape that we're in right here, which is the G shape. 
So we've got root, third, fifth, root, third, fifth, root. So, again, all those notes, just a plain old D minor arpeggio going right down the shape. But notice the rhythm. He goes da da do da da do. So he kind of repeats the rhythm that he plays before. Sounds great. So, for the next part, he goes. And yet again, he plays another arpeggio, just all of the notes of the arpeggio of the next chord we're in, which is B7. So, let's take a look at the B7 arpeggio out of the shape we're in, which is the E shape. So we've got root, third, fifth, seventh, root, third, fifth, seventh, root, third. So all of these notes right out of the B7 arpeggio. So, I mean, I, I'm guessing you could see a theme here that pretty much every chord that we've come across up till this point, he's just been playing straight, just the arpeggios. Um, you can see how good it sounds. So what makes this uh, lick extra melodic is he connects the fifth of B7 to the third of the next chord. And that next chord is E7. And he does a little chromatic approach from the 5th to the 7th. Again, he, connect, he goes by right by a half step. So let's take a look at the notes of this next chord, which is the E7 arpeggio. And right now we're in the A shape of E7. So we've got 5th, 7th, root, 3rd, 5th, 7th, root, 3rd, 5th, 7th. So again. All of those notes. Uh, right out of the E7 arpeggio. So after that, he goes... So what he's doing right there, we're still on the E7 chord at this point, and then once it goes right to the A minor 7, the A minor chord... What he does right there, he does a subtle, kind of almost like a quarter tone bend, not a full. He goes a slight tug on the third of A minor seven. Excuse me, on the third of A minor, on the root of A minor, and that's how he ends that lick. So let's play lick number two one more time slowly.
Lick number three. Let's try that one more time slowly. So to start off this lick, Jimmy uses a similar approach over the A minor chord as he did with lick one. He just plays the arpeggio straight up and down, but he plays a half step below each chord tone. So this is our A minor chord. Again, all it's just right back to the chord tones of A minor, but just with that half step approach below each chord tone. And that sounds great. Again, it sounds like a really cool kind of an exotic scale, but it's so simple. It's just half step, excuse me, a half step below each chord tone. So after that, he does a cool blues lick over the A minor 7. He goes. But instead of playing, instead of actually just plucking and fretting those notes, he bends up to them. So he goes. Bends from the D to the E. And then he goes between the E and the E flat. So that sounds, again, really cool. He could have just fretted those notes and played them. But it sounds way more bluesy when he bends up to them. And again, this is just right out of the A minor blue scale. So. After that little A minor blue scale, he goes. So again, he connects the seventh of A minor. So we've got A minor 7, connects that to the 3rd of D7. Again, so we've got that, it's a very common jazz approach, connecting the, th the 7th of one chord to the 3rd of another chord. Um, and it's not, it doesn't happen just in jazz, it happens in all different styles of music, but it's really, it's very common in jazz. And on the record, you can actually hear this note kind of catch and create a harmonic. And um, I believe on on this record, Jimmy was playing, um, I think, a PRS hollow body. Um, I think so. This was in the what, late 90s. I believe this record came out. So it could have been an arch top. Uh, I'm not an expert on what kind of gear Jimmy was using in, in that time period. I've seen some clips. Um, and he's he's definitely playing a PRS and a lot of the, the, the jazz is dead. Uh, tour dates that he was he was doing with this band, um, so I I, w I wish I had a better better way of, of of showing how to of of how to get that note to feedback like he does in in uh, in on the record. Uh, I think it's just a little bit of of combination of the guitar he was using and his and his fingers. Um, you can kind of hear it, uh, but I'm also not playing with any overdrive, and he's definitely got some overdrive for the solo. Lick number four. Let's try that slowly. So to start off this lick, Jimmy goes right, pretty much right down the F arpeggio, the F major arpeggio. So again, good old F major arpeggio is just playing the notes right out of it. For the next chord, A minor, he's got an A minor arpeggio. 
Mm-hmm. Goes right down the arpeggio. No surprises there. And to end this lick, he plays over the D7 chord. He goes. And over the G7 chord, he goes. And to play this, I'm doing a little bit of hybrid pigging. And it sounds like he is too. It doesn't sound like he's going. Which is kind of the only way to play it without using a pick and finger. So it sounds like, so what I've got here, I've got, uh, I'm holding my pick and I've got my, my pick is playing all the notes on the D string. And my index finger is playing all the notes on the B string. You, sometimes I do use my ring finger. And I'm about 90% sure Jimmy uh, is doing the same thing here. He's doing the hybrid pick thing where he's got, the, he's holding the pick. And he's got one of his fingers plucking the, so his pick is, is plucking the D string, all those notes, and his finger is plucking all the notes on the B string, so. So what's going on right here over the D7 chord? It's a pretty classic lick that you've probably heard a million times. So what those are, those are sixths. And I like to think of a sixth as a third that's flipped upside down. So what does that mean? So let's take a look at our D7 chord, and let's say, uh, let's take the, 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 the first three notes. And then we've got root, ninth, third of D7. And, let's, and we can go, just chromatically connect the ninth and the third. What if we harmonize that? That's nothing more than then just going right up the harmonized scale, and then we connect the we just connect the uh, the second two with a half step below. Now, if we take the top note and flip it down an octave we get the exact lick that he plays here. So that's all that's going on over the D7 chord. And over the G7, he plays the exact same lick, just transposed to, to G7. So overall, we've got... And then we're back to the verse. So let's talk about our next takeaway. And if you only remember one thing from this lesson, please make it this one. The most effective and musical way to use arpeggios in your improvisation is to use fragments of them. So notice in this lick, as well as every other lick we've talked about, Jimmy is consistently playing arpeggios. But he doesn't constantly go up and down the neck playing an entire arpeggio, which I often see beginners do. So for example, let's take this lick that we're in, no, lick number four, and the beginning of this lick is... Again, he's playing fragments of those arpeggios. He's, he's not playing an entire F set. He's not going... Again, which would sound good, but doing that through an entire solo can get very tiring to the ear. So again, what he's not doing is he's not playing... That would start to sound like an exercise if you did it over over every chord. So if we take the F, A minor, D7, G7, again, he's playing arpeggios, but he's not going. Oops, sorry, let's try that again. Again, he's not just playing full arpeggios over every chord, like he's playing the whole arpeggio. It starts to sound like an exercise at that point. You can kind of hear that that, that sound, and I, all, and I hear students do that all the time, kind of throughout an entire solo. Um, I was I, I played a gig not too long ago, and the keyboard player was saying how, about how he played with with a professional who all night played arpeggios up and down the neck, and it was just like like by the third song, people you know started to get bored because it's very it's very tiring to the ear to improvise like that. However, 
just playing those fragments of arpeggios and leaving space between them, which Jimmy does in this entire solo, sounds awesome. So again, we, we don't have a whole lot. He's not going. He's going. Hear that space in between? Rest. 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 So playing those fragments of arpeggios and then kind of resting and letting your phrases breathe, which is all that's going on in the solo, is kind of the key to playing a solo with arpeggios that really that really grooves and really sounds good to the listener. And this solo again, it, it's it feels very soulful to me, but it doesn't have an it doesn't have like kind of like an academic feel. And again, I'm only talking about improvisation when it comes to writing, or songwriting, and composing. Um, I, I disagree with everything I just said. I'm just talking about arpeggios in your improvising and your soloing. Again, when it comes to, to uh, arpeggios and songwriting, we, we know there's millions of songs that use arpeggios all over full big arpeggios going the whole way through. Completely different thing. I'm just talking about soloing here. So, um, again, if you want to connect with a listener and you want to play those arpeggios like Jimmy does here, just let your phrases breathe and play fragments of arpeggios. All right, guys, let's talk about the our takeaways and what's going on uh, with homework. So uh, to put this all together, what you can do is go back to the beginning of this video and check out the 50 and 75% speed buttons that are built right into the YouTube desktop version. You can play along with the solo. Try playing along to it at the 50% speed. Try again at the 75% speed. Um, and keep going and just keep, keep playing and internalizing those notes and make your way up the speed ladder uh, until you get to 100%. And this lick, this, these solos, uh, this solo is very, it's very short. Um, I'm not going to say it's easy, but it's in terms of Jimmy Herring, it's probably the, one of the easiest solos you'll ever find uh, of his, at least that I've heard. I've been listening to him for almost 20 years now and this is probably the easiest Jimmy Herring solo I ever heard but it's still it, it still has its challenges so I'm definitely not going to say it's an easy or beginner solo by any means but I feel like there is a lot that a beginner could get from it you know if you're no matter what age or level you are I feel like there's something to learn from this solo so um, as always please like and subscribe if you enjoyed this video um, and check out amarguitar.com for the tabs and uh, the chord diagrams for this We'll see you guys next time. Thanks again.